Okay, so um, now we're going to move on to quantum mechanics. And um, I certainly have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and one of the first things I did, in, as a matter of fact, was um, <clears throat> to think about Hilbert spaces. Because Hilbert spaces have a whole bunch of uh, properties that you absolutely must have, you know, inequalities. Um, and I had a few of them um, back in the day. Uh, it was easy enough to show. Uh, but do actual calculations with quaternions mm, a, in a quantum mechanic uh, context? I, I hadn't done that. I, I had done, gee, I got to get the triangle inequality. I can do that with Q star um, Q uh, sort of situation. Um, so that was good. Um, but if I, I go on with some of these uh, diagrams here, um, I was like, oh, so I've got all these lines that are zero. What if what if zero was just a dot, uh, right dead center? And then unity would be this circle around here. And that, that's great. Um, remember, I'm treating space-time as a complex plane. Because it's a complex plane and I've got a unit circle, that is the U1 symmetry. U1 symmetry is the symmetry underlying the conservation of electric charge. I was like, wow, that was not hard. <laughs> but it should also strike you as deeply strange. Why deeply strange? Well, because points, most of the points in there are going to have absolutely no way to communicate with other points in there because they're going to be space-like separated. I mean, half of them are time-like separated, so that's fine, but half of them are going to be kind of like space-like separated. So like, how the heck can they do that? In a certain sense, at this point, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm only using a pencil, okay, uh, uh, which seems kind of low tech. And wow, bang, I got to the, the, the symmetry underlying uh, electromagnetism, uh, the gauge symmetry of that. And it's like, that sounds like a really great thing. I mean, this, this is probably a thing, right? Uh, as But now if I don't think about um, the space part uh, like as a social unit, but I think of each one of them independently, then I've got the symmetry uh, SU2. Oh, and by the way, this is a thing that uh, Lobos noticed and he didn't think about the symmetry. Um, this D T squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared just said, well, that's that's what we should focus on. But if you don't think about the symmetry, then you, you miss like everything. I mean, to me, it's fascinating that I can just by drawing circles, a sphere, drawing a sphere or drawing a circle, I can get to uh, symmetries underlying the gauge symmetries of the weak field and um, and and electromagnetism. And it's like I didn't do anything. <laughs> I don't know. Is this, yes, another happy accident? Uh, anyway, I actually don't know how to do a single calculation with the weak field. <laughs> so I don't know what to do with this observation other than to say, hmm, I'm glad it's there. Um, I didn't say one. Well, and, and are you going to get out to SU3? And I think the answer is no. But... Uh, I do have the quaternion group Q8, which has eight things in it, all that are of uh, size one, all with a norm of one. And I don't know that you need much more than that to do the work, quote unquote, of SU3. In other words, the thing about SU3 is it's three squared, nine minus one. It has eight things for the eight gluons. And each one of those has a norm of one. And again, I'm not sure how much more you need than that from your group. Um, so quaternions are never going to be SU3. They're going to be Q8, and maybe Q8 is enough. I mean, it's a provocative pretend. Again, I can't do anything with a weak force. <laughs> Guess what? I can do nothing with the strong force either. But I'm kind of out of symmetries after I get up to eight, which is kind of cool because one of the deep mysteries of the standard model is why these three and why not other things and why not more things? Uh, why, do, why does the story appear to stop beside other people saying, hey, let's invent something even bigger that says there are all kinds of more particles and they're not. 
<laughs> well, I got stopped here, and I think uh, that's a good thing. All right. Um, but as I say, quantum mechanics, huge subject, okay? So how can you really be way, way, way more connected uh, to what's going on? So I came up with this testable hypothesis, and there's this wonderful book, uh, Quantum Mechanics, The Theoretical Minimum, um, by Susskind and Friedman. And I'm just going to go through this entire book and say, can I do absolutely everything they do uh, using quaternions? Hmm. And people just say, no, oh, quaternions got four. You're done. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you can follow my progress, uh, slow as it may be, uh, uh, on GitHub. Um, I've done two of the lectures so far, uh, and um, this is a companion book. And so let me answer that first question here, um, because we've got your space-time dimensions, and yes, those will always be four. There will never, ever be anything different from four, like ever, all right? Um, but then there's going to be something I call state dimensions. And what's every quaternion can be represented as a quaternion series. And this is this goes back to Newton's day. All right? You know, it's like, yeah, I can give you the sign or I could give you the uh, the series that converges to exactly the same value. And so um, we're going to have one to n states where n can be infinite. That's okay. Um, and so you see in blue, there's my space-time dimensions. So I'm always going to try and be really clear when I'm dealing with space-time dimensions or state dimensions. In fact, in <laughs> when dealing with quantum mechanics, you're almost always talking about state dimensions. Uh, but you're always working with space-time dimensions because you always see those four in blue. They're always there. And then it's just a question of how many states you have. And a lot of the work happens with just two states. And so there they are. Boom, boom. Um, and now I just have to go and prove everything can be expressed uh, using quaternion series uh, to do quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is another, I think, very deep idea um, that, again, gets to that graph that was up in the uh, front. And that is that, you know, you look around in any room and you say, hey, do all the particles here know how to do gravity? Do they know how to do electromagnetism? Do they know how to do the weak force? Do they know how to do the strong force? And do they know how to do all of these at the same time? And the answer, of course, is yes. You know, there's not like this particle says, well, I, I got tired of following the, the Maxwell equations. Uh, I'm just going to like chill on that one for a moment. And it's like, no, you don't, you got no moment to chill. And it's like, how do you do all these things all at once? And and to me, that, that graph is, uh, is kind of the way because it's just a superposition of all of these types of symmetry all in the same space. And so that's why it's so important to me to just be Mr. Automorphism in the sense of I'm always stay doing different operations, but always ending up in exactly where I was because that's where I'm going to be in the next moment. I'm going to be in the same place <laughs> in space time. OK, so um, so in summary, I'm saying you can deal with special relativity and a new approach to gravity. And uh, we're working on on the, you know, doing all problems uh, in quantum mechanics uh, using quantum uh, series. And uh, boy, I, do I have a lot more to do? <laughs> I certainly do. Uh, but if you want to join me or contribute or uh, whatever, uh, certainly feel free to contact me. All right. Thank you very much.